Good morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church Sunday morning service. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. Those of you who are here in person on this beautiful day, and also those of you who are joining us online, we want to thank you for joining us as well. And if this is your first time online watching us, we want to encourage you to visit our website sometime at www.gbcbak.org and you can learn more about the exciting things we're doing in ministry during this time. Well, we just want to uh, encourage each and every one of you, whether you're online or in person, if you would, I'd encourage you to take out your cell phone, and I would love for you to text to the number 661-589-0424. That's 661-589-0424, and simply text the word CHECK. And when you do that, you will get a link and just encourage you to click on that link and fill out the information if it's your first time. If you've done this before, you'll be just checking in and then you will be taken to our online bulletin and there you will get our announcements. You will also get um, the words for the music today. You'll get our weekly study guide to be a part of our fellowship Bible studies and also you can then get the sermon notes that we'll be doing with our series and we'll be sending those out to you following the, the service. So I encourage you to make sure that you check in again by just simply texting the word CHECK to 661-589-0424. Well, thank you for being here. Let's open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin with some music praising our Lord. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this gorgeous day. Lord, a day that you have made, a day that um, is special. Lord, to, to be having given the gift of life and to be able to come together and to worship you. And Lord, we just pray that this morning that your church, Lord, would gather and that we would proclaim the goodness and the faithfulness of our great God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this time, let's stand and sing praises to our God.
Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Christ to be our cornerstone. And Father, now as we continue to worship through hearing your word, Father, may we listen and then live out um, the message that you've given Pastor Andy for your church this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. And what a great way to start our morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Revelation. We are continuing our series as we're working through this book. We've looked at the revelation of Christ in chapter 1. We saw a picture of him as he is revealed in his glory. And then he comes and he talks to the churches that are in Asia. And there's seven churches and we're working our way through them. And today we're looking at the fifth church, the church of Sardis. And so if you will join with me in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Sardis, write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, that you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and ask that your spirit would find hearts with ears that are willing to listen to what you have to say, and Lord, to live differently. Lord, we just pray that you would do your work this morning for your glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the most part, it's not COVID that does this, although COVID is accelerating it. I'm not talking about physical death. We know that very few people actually die with just COVID. Those who have pre-existing conditions, we realize that COVID accelerates their death. But I'm not talking about the physical death of people what I'm talking about is the death of churches. And it's estimated in a recent survey that after this pandemic is over, one out of every five churches in America will be closing their door. And it's not that COVID caused it, but COVID accelerated what was already taking place with the pre-existing conditions that were found in these churches. And what used to be healthy churches one day comes to the place where sadly they're dying. And the good news is that Jesus has words of wisdom for us. And I hope today we'll listen. Let's look first at the destination of this letter. We see in verse one that this letter was written to the church of Sardis. Sardis was a very interesting city. It was a strategically defensive city. It was sitting up 1,500 feet off the valley on top of a mountain spur, and it was surrounded by cliffs on three sides and narrow isthmus on the fourth and on the fourth side. And so it was very well protected. There was one of their great kings named Croesus, who was the king of Sardis, and he was remembered for his great wealth. But he had a downfall, and that was his overconfidence. He decided to attack Sirius, the king of Persia, one day and began to lose, but they felt like they were okay because they could always go back and retreat 
and their city. And they did that and held out and they felt like they were safe until one night there was a guard that was on the city that lost, or on the wall of the city that lost his helmet and it fell down. And he went through a secret passage beneath the wall and got his helmet and came back out. But unbeknownst to him, one of the Persian guards saw him and that night they went through the secret passageway and went to the city gate. And because they were so overconfident that they could not be attacked, there was no one at the city gate. And they opened it up and the troops came in and that was their downfall, their overconfidence. And this not only happened once in the city's history, but twice. And sadly today, there are many churches and there are many Christians who have confidence in the path and confidence in the things of the world And yet they don't realize that it's this type of pride that comes before the fall as the Bible warns us. Let us look at the description of Jesus as he comes to this church in verse one as the one with the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We remember in our study in chapter one that the reference to the seven spirits refers to the Holy Spirit in Isaiah. We looked at that study of the different is in the spirit of the Lord. And we saw that this is referencing to the one day that the Holy Spirit would come and you can't live Christianity out unless you live it out in the spirit of God. And he comes here and he says, not only do I have the spirit, but I also am the authority. I have these messengers. I have these pastors who are over the church. They are there to guard and shepherd you. You need to listen to the spirit and listen to the pastor. And it's your responsibility as a church to obey the authority that I have put over you. And so he comes to the church and he comes and he begins immediately with his diagnosis. And notice what's different in this is in all the other churches, he begins by commending them on things that they're doing well. But notice here, he just becomes and starts with a strong rebuke. In verse one, he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And one of the problems with this church was they were full of people with fake conversions. It's known as nominal Christianity. It's people who in a name say that I am a Christian. They'll say, well, I'm not Buddhist. I'm not Hindu. I'm not a Muslim. Therefore, I'm in America. I must be a Christian. I mean, I come to services I, 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 I sometimes will sing. I sometimes will put something in the offering plate. That must mean I am a Christian. We read in Isaiah 29, 13, describing people like this. It says, therefore, the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their heart and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. And so we see that while they will confess with their mouth, in their heart, they do not believe. We read in Isaiah, people like this in chapter one, when we see God says, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me, and I am weary bearing them. When you spread out your hands... I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. 
And here we see that there were these people who they attended all the worship services. They went to all the feasts, all the festivals. When they were in the worship services, they were raising their hands to the Lord. They were singing out loud. They were bowing down in prayer. And God says, I can't take it anymore. You go through the motions. But the way that you're living your life, there is no Love for me, and you're definitely not loving people who are hurting. And he says, that is what I desire. It's just as Jesus said, you're like the Pharisees. You you know the word in your head, but you are far from living it out in your heart. And so he comes to this church and says, you're dead. Notice he also says that their works are not complete. What does that mean? Well, we get an idea in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, when Paul writes, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And these people were doing service projects. They, they were out and, and doing activity. They were busy doing things, even good things, needed things. But they weren't doing what was most important. Notice he tells Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Do the work of the evangelist. Remember, this is the call of our Lord. Go and make what? Disciples. And that's got to be the question we've got to ask ourselves. Are we making disciples? Are you making disciples? Are you talking to people who are not Christians and telling them about Jesus? Are you going to people who are new Christians and helping them learn how to pray, learn how to study? Or are you fulfilling the ministry? I I know you might be involved in activities. That's awesome. That's great. It's needed. But, But it's not what the call is. Jesus said this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Sardis was a church that felt good about themselves in the inside. They were an inward focused church. And they were like us four, no more, and we're happy. But this is the reality is that sooner or later, that church will die. Dr. David Jeremiah shares three observations that I think are wonderful about why churches don't die. And then three observations to what actually leads a church to die. And I think that's important for us to think about in this context. The first thing is we need to understand that churches do not die because of an outside enemy. You know, when the church is persecuted, actually, if you look in history, it actually is stronger and does better. When the attack comes from the outside, usually the church will look different, but it will actually be more powerful in reaching people and bringing them to Christ. The second reason that churches don't die is because they commit suicide. There are not very many churches, healthy churches, that just wake up one day and say, you know what? Man, look at how great things are. We love each other. We're studying God's word. We're praying. Uh, Let's just abandon Jesus and just not meet anymore. It's not because they willfully do it. And then third, it's not because of abandonment. You see, God never leaves the church and doesn't just say, you know what? I'm not willing to bless you. In fact, he looks at the faithful in this church and says, I see the remnant and I'm still willing to do the work right now if you'll let me. And so it's not God's fault that the church dies. It's our fault. And so why does a church die? Well, the first is there's the death of individual members. Think about our body. Our body is made up of different cells and different members. And when they begin to die, it begins to affect the rest of the body. You might have a healthy body, but if you have a bad kidney, guess what? It's going to begin to start affecting the rest of the body. And the same thing happens in the life of the church. When when individual members stop praying, stop studying, stop coming to church, stop giving, 
Stop, stop being willing to share their faith that it slowly begins to affect the rest of the body and it begins to die. The second reason he states is that they rest on their past. You know, many churches start out as a movement of God, but then they get to the place where they become a machine and just start going through the motions. And then finally they get to the place where they become a monument and it's just a building for people to come and look at. And, and, and what we need to realize is that we need to always be people who are stepping out in faith and trusting God to do the next thing. And when we get to the place where we stop being a people who act on faith and believe God is going to grow and reach new people, then we begin to come to the place where we're a dying church. And then we see that they were also undiscerning. If you would have asked this church, how do you see yourselves? This church would have said, man, look, look at how great we are. Look at all that we have. And it's Jesus who comes and looks at them and says, listen, do you not realize that you're on your way to dying? And we need to make sure that we are discerning people and that we live with eyes and be able to say, if I, as a church member, am not able to participate and step up and do what I'm called to do, then sooner or later, the church is going to die. John MacArthur in his commentary on the book of Revelation talks about how stars are trillions of miles away. And that when we look at light years, we know that light travels 186 miles per second. And so that the closest stars are about 6 trillion miles away. And so if we see a close star that's just 30 light years away, and let's say it died five years ago, we're still going to see the light for 25 years. And he says, this illustration perfectly sums up the situation in many churches. They still shine with the reflected light of a brilliant past. Looking at them from a distance, one might think nothing has changed. And yet spiritual darkness of false teaching and sinful living have extinguished the light on the inside, though some of their reputation may still remain. And this was the church of Sardis. It had a reputation of being alive, but the Lord had come and said it was dead. We saw that the church of Ephesus had abandoned its first love. The church of Thyatira began to welcome in this worldliness and this toleration of sin. And now we see this new low of Sardis, that it is dead. It could have been nicknamed the church of the tares because it was full of people who were dominated by sin and unbelief and false doctrine. But Jesus comes and he says, I have a word to you. And today, this is what I want us to focus on. What can we do to make sure that we don't become a dying church? And the first thing I want you to look at in verse two is he says, be watchful. We need to pay attention. We, we need to, to look, as he says, be watchful and, and see what is taking place. Be alert. Look at the truth and the reality of what is going on and where you see things that are weak. Make sure that you go and pay attention and take care of those things. Notice the second thing he says is make sure that you strengthen the existing ministries. He says in verse two, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. And it's foundational that at this time in this pandemic, during this COVID time, the things that we still have going, we better make sure they remain strong, amen? And so we need to make sure that we understand that at Grace, we are blessed to have some amazing, wonderful, gifted, talented Bible teachers. Yet it breaks my heart every Sunday 
that we get to say, hey, you know what? We had to have time to study God's word together. And most of the people get up and go to their cars instead of staying and saying, hey, let's fellowship for 30 minutes and let's study God's word together. And if we will not strengthen what we have, folks, guess what is going to happen over time? It is going to die. The children's ministry, the youth ministry, the college ministry, the young adult ministry, the senior ministry, if we will not strengthen what we have today, over time, we will die. And so we must strengthen what we have in each person must say, I am willing to be a part of what I'm supposed to do. Because once the critical mass begins to pull away, that's when the body begins to die. Notice third, he says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. We need to remember what it was like when the word of God came in the power of the spirit of God and changed our lives. I, I love that he says, don't remember what you heard. That's important. But he says, remember how you heard it. And it's so important in this day and time that we remember that if it wasn't for a faithful and true church that passed the word of God on to us, we wouldn't be saved today. And how important it is that we maintain that light in our community so that people here can be saved. I was reading this week, unfortunately, a new study that came out by Barna. And it talks about the changing landscape in the American church. He says it's a new reformation where the church is adopting more cultural standards than biblical standards. And the thing that's heartbreaking is that when he looked at evangelicals who would be the most conservative of the Christian churches, this is what he found. 75% of those evangelicals he surveyed said that man is basically good inside and not evil and not a sinner. 43% believe that Jesus sinned sometime while he was still on earth. Now think about that. 43% of conservative evangelical Christians think that Jesus sinned. 58% believe, this is the majority, 58% believe the Holy Spirit is just a symbol rather than a real person who ministers to us. 40% do not believe in human life being sacred. 34% do not believe marriage is just between one man and one woman. And we wonder, why is the church dying in America? It's because we do not remember the spirit and the word. We realize there's three types of people that fill the churches. There's the nominal Christian who is in name only. There's the carnal Christian who really has a relationship with God, but they're choosing to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. And then there's the spirit-filled Christian. And this is who we have to be in Grace Baptist. We have to be men and women who say we bring the word of God and the spirit of God. We remember Christ you are holding the Spirit of God. And, it, and it it's you who gives that to us. And so we are the one who will walk in that. Notice as he continues in verse three, he says, make sure you hold fast and repent. Many times you don't realize what you have until you lose it. And then when it's gone, you'd wish that you would have done more to... Keep it. And he says, listen, I want you to hold on that, 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 or hold fast. That word means to hold on so tightly as if your life depended on it, like you're hanging on a rope and, and you can't let go. And he says, listen, I want you to make sure you hold fast to the good things and the true things. Hold fast to what you have here at Grace Baptist because it's special, it's unique, but you're going to have to make sure that you put effort into it. And if you're not, 
If you are a person that usually gets up and walks and leaves, you're a person who doesn't come and pray. You're a person who's not a part of a small group. You're a person who is not giving. He comes and he says, you need to repent. You've got to do differently. You can't keep living the way you are and expect that the church is going to get stronger and better. Because this is the key to having a strong church is to have strong families. And the way to have strong families is to have strong individuals. And so he comes and he challenges us and he says, we also need to be grateful for those who are faithful. And he comes here and he says in verse four, there are a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. And can I say, we are very blessed at Grace Baptist because there are a few that just pour out so much to keep everything going. And today, I just want to acknowledge you. You know who you are. And I just want to thank you for your faithfulness to, to, to making sure that Grace Baptist is a strong church, but we have to realize that the way the church will go is the way the critical mass of the church will go. And what we have to do is we have to encourage not just a faithful few, not 20%, but that our church as a body unites and says, we will be the church that God has called to be, spirit-filled Christians devoted to the cause that you have called us in loving God and loving others and reaching the world. You know, God is always looking for the faithful few. You remember, he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham says, what if there's 50? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's just what? 10. And there wasn't even 10. There was a time in Ezekiel that he was just looking for one. Listen to what he says. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery and mistreated the poor and needy and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. And therefore I have poured out my indignation on them and I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own head. And Jesus says, listen, I'm going to come as a thief in the night to this church. And you better be ready. You better be watchful. You better not be overconfident. Because when I come, and if you're not ready, it's going to be over. And I think the question we have to ask today, and I want each and every member to think of this question. If Every member at Grace Baptist Church was like me. Our church would be like this. You might want to write that down and just contemplate and pray over that. If every member of the church was like me, our church would be like this. And I hope that we can come back and say, you know what, God? We are a church of spirit-filled Christians who, who are serving and ministering the gospel. If every Christian at Grace Baptist will step up and allow the spirit to guide them and unite and put the kingdom first, Jesus comes and says, there's three blessings that you can expect. Notice the first, he says, is you will receive a white garment. He who overcomes in verse five shall be clothed in a white garment. We read later in Revelation that these garments represent the righteous acts of the saints. But we need to understand that this righteousness is not our righteousness. The Bible says that when we do our righteousness, it's filthy rags to God. Our works and our flesh 
mean nothing. But, but when we live in this relationship with God, when we are saved by Jesus Christ and out of that relationship, he does a work in through us, that is when true righteousness comes. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so when we're loving him, what we have this desire to do is to obey him. And it's important that we understand that just because you are invited to the wedding feast doesn't mean that you get to attend. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 22, verse 11. He says, but when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. And we need to understand that Jesus will save anyone, no matter what they've done, amen? Amen. But he also says this, in order to come to the kingdom of God, you must repent and believe. And when we repent and we believe, then he gives us the robe. And we can't come into heaven saying, well, I'm coming because I understand that it's free. Yeah, it's free. But you have to have the robe of righteousness that is given to you. And if you want to continue to live in your sin and live your way and not repent and not believe and not receive, then even though you're invited, you're not allowed to enter. Notice he also says your name will be written in the book of life. In the ancient cities, we read that when one was born, their name was recorded into the book of citizens. And if they were ever convicted of a crime or they did something of bad reputation, that is when their name was blotted out. And what he's saying here is that if you remain true, your name will never be blotted out. We'll look more specifically at the book of life later as we go through the book of Revelation. But I want you to see that your name remains. And then third... Notice he comes and he says in verse five, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I can't think of a greater honor and what that day is gonna be like when you pass away and you go to heaven and it won't be Peter that comes and announces you. But can you imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, comes in and says, Father, all the angels, will you stop and listen? I want to announce to you today that this is, and he will say your name. And say, that one is mine and that one remain faithful. There is nothing greater in this life that you could ever give me than to know that Jesus Christ knows my name and will proclaim it to his father and his angels. Oh, that we would live and be a church that is alive. That he would gather the church of Grace Baptist one day and he would say, listen, this is Grace Baptist, my well done and good and faithful servant. And we would be able to stand there and just be filled with joy that God had done a work in and through us. This summer, something strange happened in my backyard. We had three fruit trees When we moved there, we had an orange tree, we had an apricot tree, and then we had a tree that I don't know what it did because it never bore any fruit. It had leaves on it, and it would have leaves that would come in the season and not when it, you know, and then the winter die and then come back, but it never bore any fruit. And this summer, one day we just looked back 
outside and that tree had fallen over and it was dead. And it was interesting as I thought about that, that tree was not living the purpose that it was intended for. It was not useful. And it reminded me of the words, and I want us to close today as we think about being a church that will live for God and being a Christian who will live for God. As we listen to Jesus' word found in John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, You can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abides in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that we would be a joyous church that we would be a church that if you were to come today and speak, that you would say you are alive. You're not dying. Lord, we know that there are many churches in our city, in our state, in our country, in the world, Lord, that are hurting right now. Lord, it breaks my heart to, to think that if this survey is correct, that one out of every five churches will close their door in the next year and a half. Father, we just want to thank you that you're doing something different here at Grace, but Lord, we need to first of all examine are we just pretending and playing a game and we're claiming to be a Christian in name only? Or Lord, does the Spirit of God truly abide in us? Do we really have a personal relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit? God in spirit who is given to us as our comforter and our helper when we make that decision to follow you. And I just pray today, if there's anyone here who has never come to the place and they don't know where they would spend eternity, that today they would make that decision to say, Jesus, I believe that you died in my place for my sin. And today I'm ready to repent and not follow my way, but yours. And I'm ready to die to myself and believe that you rose again to give me life. And right now, Jesus, I just ask that you would save me and fill me with your spirit. And Lord, I'm ready to live for you. Father, I just pray for the Christian, whether they're here at this service or they're listening online, that just needs to say, Father, I'm ready to be what you have called me to be as a Christian to be spirit-filled and to be part of the church and to do what you have called us to do, to study the word together, to pray, to serve, to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I gotta be honest. If I had to answer that question right now, if every member was like me right now, Lord, the church would be in a bad state. And Lord, that's gonna change today because you've called me to be different. And Father, for the faithful few, the ones who are doing all that they can, Father, may they carry no other burden, but may they just reflect on the fact that you know their name and Lord, their name will one day be announced by you. Lord, we thank you for that promise. 
And Lord, we pray that one day when we're in your glory together as Grace Baptists, that as a church and as families and as individuals, you will announce us because we were faithful to you for your glory and that our joy may be full. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here today and you never accepted Christ as your Savior or if you're online and today you're making that decision for the first time, I'd like for you to text the word HOPE to 661-589-0424 or if you're here in person in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of invitation and I encourage you to come and talk to me today. Maybe you are in need of prayer. Maybe you have a prayer to say, pray for me as I want to live my life differently as a Christian. Maybe some of you are making that decision today and you would need prayer and I'll be over here for that. Also know there's some of you that attended our new members class and you're ready to make that decision to become members and understand that we're gonna be spirit-filled Christians here at Grace to be a church that's alive and to serve. But as the Lord leads, will you obey? Let's stand and sing. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, today I've got some good news. We've got some members that we would like to present to you that completed our new members class and for you to receive into the church today. So I'm going to ask the Martins to come forward first. This is um, James and Megan Martin. They are from Kentucky, recently moved here. James is one of the most smartest guys in the world. Um, He's going to school at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary online, and that's where I went. So you can't, uh, you know, do much better than that. And um, I want to ask Nicholas and Stephanie McNeil to come. And uh, they also have their daughter, Taylor, who is coming. Taylor today is going to be baptized, but... um, Nicholas and Stephanie have been attending our church for probably almost a couple months now, 
and uh, they have felt like this was a family that they have been looking for. They're recently newly married, had their church, their church thing, but now they want our church, and so they're very excited about coming today, and both um, James and Nicholas are going to be interns in our church. They're going to be serving um, and helping out with some of the tasks that we have, and then um, we want to ask Bill King to come forward. Many of you know Bill. I'm surprised that uh, he's not a member already, but he is one of our faithful servants, and uh, we are very, very excited about um, him making this official. He loves our church, has been very faithful to our church, uh, serves in our food ministry, serves in our greeters. I just want to thank you. So if you would like to receive these as new members into Grace Baptist Church, would you say amen? Amen. amen. And we're excited and um, in just a little bit, we're going to have our fellowship groups. And after our fellowship groups today at 1030, we have some baptisms and hope that you will stay um, for that. I also just want to encourage you real quickly, if you'll look on your uh, check-in page, you can click on the word announcements and there you will see some upcoming announcements. Just a few things. Our small groups are going to be doing community outreach. We can't really do large outreaches, um, but we can uh, be able to find smart ways for our small groups to care for people during this time. And so we're going to encourage our small groups to do a community outreach project this fall and just want to encourage you to be a part of that. If you're not a part of a small group, after today's sermon, you're probably signing up right now. Amen? Amen? All right. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. And um, you can be involved. It'll be great to use your gifts and to be able to serve others. There's also a young adult fellowship that we're doing. It's called the Pumpkin Palooza. You can read about the details of that, but you can sign up if you're between 18 and 40. We'd love for you and your family to come and be a part of that. And then also um, in two weeks, we're going to have a special business meeting for the church. We're going to be looking at doing some remodeling in our sanctuary next Sunday morning at 830. We're going to share a little bit about what we're looking to do as far as updating some of the bathrooms and the lobby area. And then uh, the following week, you'll get to be able to vote on that. So we'll share about that next week at 830 and hope that you'll be here to hear about that. Well, I know that we can't technically okay, shake hands, give everybody a hug. But today, if you'll just stay six feet apart and just come by and maybe like wave or maybe give a fist bump to our new people. Amen. Can we do that? Amen. All right. Well, let's stand and close in a word of prayer. And then I want to encourage you to go to your fellowship groups. Our middle-aged couples are on the south side. Our seniors will be underneath the uh, sanctuary here. The young adults are over here. And let's see, I think Jerry, do you have an announcement? Everybody, we're going to keep a good day in the service, amen? Very good day. So by a raise of hands, how many people know this is a, pre, a Pastor's Appreciation Month, and today is Pastor Appreciation Day? How many know? I didn't, but luckily Sister Colleen did, so that's a good thing. So Brother Steve and, and Roxy, if you'd come forward also. We just want to, Grace Baptist, we're very blessed in many, many ways. And not the least is with our pastor and his family and our family minister and his family and what they've meant to us. You know, a lot of times, we, I think we take for granted um, those that mean the most to us. And we just, you know, what they do, they do quietly. They do for the Lord. They don't do for this kind of um, uh, recognition. But we want to make sure that uh, we do recognize their service. And Brother Steve and Sister Roxy as family ministers, you know, I'll say at Grace Baptist, we've been very blessed to have them in our, our congregation, amen? You know, if you look at what a servant's heart is, you'll see that in this, this couple right here. They don't look for recognition. They don't look to be out front. They just want to be used in wherever that God has for them to be used. And at Grace Baptist, we're very blessed to have them. And so uh, Brother Steve, Sister Roxy, Brother Jerry has a card there for you. And it's just a small token of the appreciation that we have for the love they have for God and the love they have for our church. And so 
Let's, let's have an applause for them and the work they do. Thank you, guys. Amen. And also at this time, we want to appreciate and show our appreciation to Brother Andy, uh, First Lady Sister Christine. She loves, if you want to call her that, she loves for you to call her the First Lady. She's not going to come, see? She is a rebellious woman. <laughs> no, you know what? She is an absolute sweetheart. And I'm telling you, behind every successful pastor is a godly woman. And at Grace Baptist, we have a godly uh, pastor's wife that loves God first, loves her husband and her family and supports them, and then also loves the church that they serve at. And Sister Christine, we thank you very much. And also, Pastor Andy, you know, um, I've used the word blessed, and I do believe at Grace Baptist we're blessed in many ways. The, the freedom we have, the liberty we have, the fellowship that we have. Our pastor, Brother Andy, is a blessing from God. You know, he loves God first, and, and, he, and he lets you know that, that God is first. He loves his family, but he loves his church family at Grace Baptist. And, you know, we're very blessed. He's a very learned man. And sure, it's a little annoying for the elders when we go to meetings, we have to kiss his ring and call him <laughs> Dr. Andy, you know, before any meeting begins. But actually, it's not true. I lied. Brother Andy, you know, if you do sit on those meetings or you deal with him, you realize the love he has for God. And I will tell you the love that he has for Grace Baptist Church. And uh, like I said, we're very blessed. And Brother Rod has a, a small token of appreciation from Grace Baptist, just showing him the love and the appreciation we have for him. And, you know, one of the ways that you know that he loves you is when you listen to the sermon today. You know, we, we teasingly call him Andy Osteen, but actually, he doesn't hold back on the word of God. Amen? And, when, you know, don't get your feelings hurt. Be thankful that you have a man of God that's okay if you get your feelings hurt. He cares more about your relationship with God and your eternity. So, Brother Andy, thank you very much. We love you very much.